Good morning, this is Deborah V. Wilson. The date is the 29th of January 2018 and the time is 400 hours and 20 minutes and that's GMT minus 6. The title of my podcast this morning is My Weekly Shop at Sainsbury's, The C2 Bus, and Another Look at the Dynamics of Privilege. Approximately 30 years ago, I lived in London, England. I've never had a driver's license, so I have always relied on public transportation. That's piece one. Piece two is whilst I lived in London, England that particular time, I was befriended by a white man who appeared able-bodied, who was also a member of the Met, the Metropolitan Police Service. I have a sense of direction that can be best described as non-existent, which is one of the reasons I don't have a driver's license. The, my mate, the Met officer, recognized that right away. And one of the things he suggested uh, was that in my weekly journeys that I reach out to some of his colleagues, other white men who were heterosexual, who appeared to be able-bodied. Make sure you let my mates know who you are. I've told them about you. So when you go out and about, if you get lost, they'll make sure to help you. On Friday evenings, after I finished my volunteer job, I'd head to Camden in London, England to do my weekly shop at the Sainsbury's. It was always crowded because everybody else has the same idea, had the same idea. They'll do their shop right after work. So it's taken care of for the weekend. So I'd load myself up with my weekly purchases and I'd put it all in a carrier bag that was rather large. And then I had this large handbag I carried and I went from the Sainsbury's to the C2 bus stop. It was a weekly tradition. I'd always make sure I saw my Met officer, my mate, friend, and wave at him. He'd wave and ask me, how are you doing? We did this bit of exchange. So as usual, when you catch rely on public transportation when you're trying to catch a bus there's always inevitably a delay you get used to it when you rely on public transportation and then there's this dynamic that happens when the bus is delayed it's happened every place i've ever lived in which i've relied on public transportation the bus is late sometimes very late as was the case that friday evening and then two buses come along And then the bus drivers, I've had this happen in every city in which I rely on public transportation. So the originally late bus is packed because it's now picking up passengers uh, that were the, the scheduled, on their scheduled route, and then new passengers have come along, additional passengers, because the bus is late. Then there's that bus right behind it that actually should be picking up the overflow passengers, but the driver appears to be intentionally slowing down. So he, she isn't burdened with this hectic onrush of passengers who are now really probably a little bit disgruntled and it was the winter, so we were all cold. It's happened in every city I've ever lived in which I relied on public transportation. This dynamic of a late bus, and then they actually two buses come together, and then the second bus literally slows down that driver and lets the late bus pick up the originally scheduled passengers and the overflow passengers that have resulted because the bus was late. They're actually the overflow probably belong on that second bus. So like everybody else at that bus stop, I saw the crowded bus. I had my carrier bag, my handbag, there was a really large handbag and I was pretty much overloaded with things. And I wanted to get on that second empty bus. He wouldn't let us on. He stopped about a half a block away 
and he was literally shooing us. You could see the big bus window shooing us on the other to get on the crowded bus. Well, I, I was there was no way I could because I had a large amount of groceries and I was so laden down with my purchases and my oversized handbag, there was no way that I could have made the journey on the bus. So I decided, okay, whatever, I'll let the crowded bus go and the second empty bus go. Then all of a sudden, someone grabs my arm. It's my met officer's friend, his mate, my mate, friend and he takes me by the arm he actually took me by the arm like he was uh i've never been arrested but i've certainly seen people arrested and actually that's how he grabbed my arm i'll never forget it and we he walks me like approximately and not even half a block because while he's walking with me he's motioning to that empty bus driver to pull up the crowded bus with those passengers leave. So I'm the only one now standing there. What looks like I'm being accosted by this police officer. The bus comes, we're walking towards the bus, the police officer and myself, and the bus is walk, slowly coming up, driving up to us. As the bus comes closer and closer, I can see the driver is South Asian, a South Asian man. And I can see the look on his face, uh, I don't know if I'm projecting or not, uh, but he seemed confused and a bit frightened. In any case, the bus gets, we meet, the bus drive, the met officer screams at him to open the door. He opens the door, he's still holding me by the arm. The bus drive, the met officer then screams at me and says, well, this really rough voice with a British accent that I'm not gonna attempt, That'd be too embarrassing. He tells me to get on the bus. So I already had my bus, my travel card in my pocket and I'm reaching out to get my travel card to, to show the driver to, to do the business so he knows I've got money to pay for my fare. The, my, the cop behind me, who's behind me on the bus, getting on the bus screams at me, sit down. So I take myself with my laden self with the carrier bag full of groceries and my oversized purse and I sit down. The bus is empty, okay? And this white police officer proceeds to scream at the South Asian driver. What did you think you were doing? Didn't you see her standing there? What's your problem, mate? That's a sanitized version. So he tells the driver would stop to let me off on, would stop to take me to. He gets off the bus, but before he leaves the cop, he turns to me, he says the name of my mate, the, his, also his mate, our shared connections, this another white male, you know, police officer. And he's, then he says to me, all right, love, have a good evening. I don't recall, it wasn't necessarily a long journey from that bus stop in Camden to the stop, my stop, but I don't recall that bus driver, the South Asian gentleman, stopping to let anyone else on. I kept sitting with my groceries next to me on the seat and clutching to my handbag. I don't know why I was, there was no one else on the bus. So the whole security thing I went to through, like all commuters on public transportation, I didn't need to do it, there was no one else. But every once in a while my eyes would meet with the South Asian bus driver who now looked angry at me. And he kept staring at me intermittently whilst looking at the road and the, our eyes continually met during the journey. And I kept saying, I, I have, I have the bus fare because I never paid and I still remember that to this day and I kept saying over and over again I have the bus fare and he kept shaking his head telling me not to stand up to pay the fare. So we sat um, going through this journey that was only a few minutes but I still remember the look of the South Asian gentleman. It was a mix of fear, a mix of well, what was going on there, this black woman with this white police officer. Why was this white police officer so 
concerned about the transit services this black woman was receiving. What I remember also was the fact that it was cold that night, the fact that I was bummed out that I was going to have to wait for another bus. And then what I, I'm a complainer and I thought to myself, I see the bus number, I was going to complain about the bus not stopping to let us on. But I was just going to wait for another bus. But then I kept thinking to myself in that short bit of journey, and it happened again almost 30 years ago, I've never forgotten it, that I didn't have to do any of that. Because this white man, tall, a med officer, who appeared to be in his 30s, who had a deep booming voice, decided no, that this South Asian bus driver was not going to bypass this woman of African descent, me. It, it's such a small, on one level, insignificant situation what happened. Because if you use public transportation, I'd be surprised if you haven't had a similar experience. But the political dynamics in that situation in that encounter between, with the three of us, the South Asian bus driver, myself, and the white police officer. The white police officer, I think, with all due respect for what he did for me, probably stepped out of his mandate just a wee bit. I think he stepped out of his mandate because he is he was friend with my friend and my friend my mate was another white police officer so the disrespect that many commuters experience that night i didn't have to experience it because the privilege the social positioning of this white male police officer, and I've named the other identities that I won't repeat again, stepped into play. And this South Asian bus driver, who, like the other people standing waiting for the bus, and we were all, might I add, disproportionately female and women of color, he shooed us away. He shooed us away. Those other women, disproportionately, commuters who were disproportionately women of color got on the crowded bus but because I had a white mate who was a cop a med officer and his mate agreed to look out for me the privilege of their identities was for a moment in this minute of sociological experiments my evening commute I received for the moment some of the privilege of this of the identity of the white met officer young peered able bodied big booming voice the stereotype we have of heterosexual men I remember the South Asian man shooing us away to get on the crowded bus. Black women, Asian women, like myself, loaded down with groceries, like myself for whatever reason, not utilizing a car, a private vehicle, or a taxi, relying on public transportation. And I remember that for me, in that most minute of sociological experiences, experiments, I didn't have to suffer that indignity. I got an entire bus, I was the only passenger on the bus, to myself. That driver wouldn't have stopped for me had it not been for the privileged position of that white med officer. That white med officer would not have done that for me if I didn't have some of the privilege for my white met officer friend, my mate, 
who had previously told his that particular officer and other officers to keep an eye on me. In that small social exchange, I experienced a dynamic that I call the transfer or the sharing of privilege. The incident, again, happened approximately 30 years ago. I've never forgotten it because I've had other incidents where I have experienced and been protected, in quotes, by the privilege of white men where you dare not question what's being asked of you where you dare not slight and disrespect because a white man has stepped in and you dare not. That the slight and not so slight indignities that marginalized persons, in this case, black and brown women doing a weekly shop, are used to. An empty bus driver refusing to stop. The bus driver, by the way, was also a person of color, but he refused to stop because he didn't want to be bothered with all the hustle and bustle of us, the women with all of our grocery bags. So in that space, the power he had was to say, you're not getting on my bus, now get on a crowded bus. I got to see in that little example some hierarchies and how they played out. I remembered how I have to say I was delighted that I was able to get on the bus and I had space to spread my belongings out and I wasn't questioned. I didn't have to worry about someone snatching my handbag while I'm watching my groceries. I remember the relief I felt at being protected, but I also remember the shame I felt because I wondered what, how that South Asian man, I wondered how he read and constructed that dynamics between myself, my black female self, and that white male self. And when my bus stop came, I got my I gathered my belongings. As you do, you know your stop is coming up. I gathered my belongings, and I walked to the front of the bus. I was sitting near the front. I was the only passenger again, and I muttled again. I did have the fare. He didn't respond. And I told him, have a good evening. He didn't respond. It's just a small example. It's rather in some ways insignificant, but for me it's not. I continue to look at those who are in privileged positions and what that privilege means for them in their daily lives. Things known and unknown, things taken for granted. I look at those of us who are in positions that are not always privileged and what small and significant indignities we tolerate in our daily lives. You don't sweat the small stuff because there's bigger indignities you're dealing with. And then I look at my friendship with that Met officer and what that friendship meant. And for me, what that friendship meant is some of his privilege, and privilege is power, societal power, and some of that privilege but you can share. Privilege is shareable. You can share. And so I looked at that, and I always look at that incident on the C2 bus that my mate, who had told his mate to keep an eye on me, and what it sociologically meant, they shared their privilege. And that that slight indignity that the other black and brown women that evening had to endure, I didn't have to endure. Simple little story from 30 years ago. But I would ask you to think and reflect, particularly if you are in a position of privilege and what that position means and what little indignities do you imagine. You probably don't. But what little indignities do you imagine you have avoided in your day? just your daily commute because you are privileged and for a second if you can step out of your privilege and imagine what indignities great and small those who are less privileged endure on a daily basis this is Deborah V. Wilson 
And oh, I'm in, I forgot to say, how could I forget? I'm in Canada. I am Winnipeg, in Winnipeg, and it again is cold. Thank you very much. <laughs>